Welcome to Afro Science Stories, tales from scientists from Africa. Good morning, Prof. Um, Good morning. Nice to have this interview with you. Um, let's start by looking at where you grew up and um, how you grew up. All right. So my parents are both retired educationists. They were all teaching at different levels. And I spent most of my childhood at a couple in the Eastern region, where we moved around a bit. That's, I would say that's where I was born and bred. And so my parents, as I already indicated, are educationists. I have five other siblings, and so there are six of us. I'm the fourth and the second daughter. And we grew up around books, obviously. <laughs> you know, that was the trade. So if your parents are business people, you, you end up probably growing up around business. If they are farmers, cocoa farmers, you end up being a cocoa farmer. So, Obviously, I grew up around books, and so that's how it was. At Nkoko, we lived at the secondary school in Bangalore, South Bangalore. And you know, most of the schools in Ghana are sited in the outskirts of town. With time, the, the town grows on them, but most of the time it's in the outskirts. And so we have a lot of greenery. And so we spent a lot of time outdoors, playing in the woods, catching insects, you know, that kind of adventure. And I think that opened me and my siblings up to the world of curiosity. That's interesting. So you were always a bookworm? Let's, yeah. Can we say that? No. Unless you would help me define what a bookworm is. <laughs> because I, yes, I'm an associate professor of chemistry, but I sew, mm -hmm. I do knitting, okay. I play the flute, I dance. I write poetry, I write love poems. So. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So you are, you are way... If that is a book one, then I am... No, that, that's not a book one. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's somebody who is open to a lot of uh, different experiences. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. So, um, for your inspiration to become a scientist started from this background? Like I want it? to believe so, yeah, yeah because I ask a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. I, every time, I remember my childhood very well. I remember as young as age three. I still I remember things that happened when I was age three. So yes, I asked a lot of questions, and I wanted to understand, especially with the environment, the outdoors. You discover new things every day: new birds, new species of insects. Sometimes you catch them and bring them home, and they're like, "No, we'll drop it." You know, yeah. <laughs> this is dangerous. So that will sets you on a path of asking questions and I found out the science. But then subconsciously I think my father in particular programmed me to do science. Now looking back okay. because for me in particular most of the books that were bought for me were science related. Okay. Though we had bookshelves with a wide range of books, mm -hmm. I was particularly given a lot of science books to read. Okay. So now looking back I think I was programmed, but I didn't know that I was being programmed. <laughs> so were you always like the best student in school? Like typically in Ghana, we think all the Basic different. school, yes. Okay. Basic school, yes. Though I was the youngest, uh, I was two or three years younger than the average age mm -hmm. in the class. Um, so I was right from kindergarten. And they would put you up for the school play, for the poetry recital. Up to date, my family still teases me with some of the lines <laughs> of some of the plays we, we used to stay in. I 
remember things that are from you also. So yes, but then somewhere along the line, because of I was young, I think um, that will be if I should convert, that should be primary five. My performance went down a bit. I think I was dealing with my own growing up. You know, being surrounded by older people. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't conscious about it, but now I think that's what it was. Okay. And so I remember my mom saying that, Pro, you are so young, so if you don't perform this term, I'll make sure you repeat the class. And that was another turning point oh. because I wasn't going to repeat the class. <laughs> so it spared you on you. Yes, again. Yeah. So you, you've mentioned curiosity as one of the key attributes um, that are putting you to this level. Um, what other attributes have been? Prominent in pushing you to where you are today? Uh, with science, discipline is part of it. And uh, again, growing up as a Catholic uh, child, Catholics uh, discipline. People might think they are liberal, but when you're hit, <laughs> when you're Catholic, you know that <laughs> it's a whole school of discipline. So, being a practicing family, Catholic family, and a practicing Catholic myself, it, that helps me adopt to any form of discipline, be it professionally or secular. So yes, discipline. Without discipline, you cannot really do science. There are times you feel like sleeping, but maybe there's an experiment that you need to check out on in the lab. So you wake up and you go. I remember during my PhD, there were times I had to set an alarm and wake up at dawn and take the tram and go to the lab to check on me if something I have put in the oven or something. So these are some of the um, sacrifices you make. Uh, in order to get ahead in science and it takes discipline to do that. Okay. So um for instance in pursuing a, a STEM career, did, was there a key point you think that you decided that I would go with science or STEM related issues or or it just happened? Um it's both. It just happened because as I said now I know I was programmed. So even in the in the uh, middle school my school was a new school. I was within, I was the first uh, pupil actually to be enrolled, <laughs> and so this, the school grew with my batch. So when we were in the primary uh, middle school form one, was when there was a district uh, science competition, and then I had to go and contest with seniors from other schools. So with that, I then I it was like okay, science is something I will probably do when I go to the secondary mm -hmm. school. And then after secondary school science, I, I ended up doing chemistry. But I will say the time when I had this consciousness would be when I was doing my national service as a teaching assistant. Because before that, I still was toying with the idea. I like policy. I like to speak, organize speaking. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I was quite a bit fascinated by UNESCO, um, EPA in Ghana, and that kind of policy interface where science is uh, practiced. And so, as I mean, moving on to national service, I was so torn with that idea that I went with EPA for some time and went work with UNESCO. <laughs> and, but it was when I completed national service and I started having conversations about options that I had this one conversation and the person was like, okay. You've been a TA, wouldn't you like to lecture? I said, well, I know I can't teach. I've been teaching since 83, <laughs> peer teaching. Okay. But uh, then he said, okay, if you want to teach in Ghana, then it's better if you specialize in one particular track and bring bits and pieces. Because at that, at that time, I wanted to go to civil engineering to do water supply, environmental sanitation, or to do pharmaceutical application for my master's. So after having that conversation, meaning I, these two tracks were not really for academia, but for the field of practice and that policy. But then having that conversation set me thinking, and I finally decided that, okay, I think I'll go with academia. And if that is so, then I have to pursue chemistry. So um, in, in, in that journey, um, like you mentioned, you have to talk to a few people. Um, how how prominent was the role of uh, role models? How how did they feature? Was this person a role model? I call him a mentor because <laughs> one workshop I attended, they say role model is someone you, you look up to, but they probably don't even know you are looking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the mentor is the one you have interactions Interact, with. Yeah. 
So these were these are mentors, and mentorship has really played a key role in whatever it is I have achieved. Right from mentorship from home, <laughs> my parents, and then professional mentors. And, well, this person doesn't know he mentored me that much. I'm just waiting till when I become a full professor, okay. and I'm going to tell him that that conversation was a terrible. Mm. He doesn't know. I'm okay. Sure he doesn't okay. Remember. <laughs> so we won't mention his name then. No. Okay. But I have had other mentors who everybody know. Mm. But this person is not like a day-to-day mentor. But I needed to have that conversation and he happened to be available. And this input was useful. Mm. Great. So um, I think can I can dovetail into, so what is your current role after going through the whole journey? We've not mentioned your current role. Um, I think you can tell us what are you actually doing now. Okay, so I got uh, promoted to associate professor of chemistry a couple of years ago, and uh, that does not change your life in any way, as, <laughs> as I always say, because then you continue to do the things you are passionate about, which is teaching and uh, outreach and uh, public science engagement, which I have done for more than five years and I continue to do. But I think what it does, the, the position does, or the promotion does, is that it, uh, it gives you more visibility and then uh, everybody wants a piece of you. Okay. <laughs> so it increases the request uh, to, to have you engage with uh, people. But I'm not playing any statutory role mm-hmm. of the university. Recently, I got uh, appointed to lead the Young Researchers Forum. Okay which is um, uh, a baby if I should use that mm-hmm. of the vice chancellor. And so it's, the forum is supposed to help build uh, research citizenship and enthusiasm among the younger faculty and researchers of the university. So um, what are you doing currently in terms of research? Um, what are some what are the, the work you are doing and how it's impacting society? As an, environment, as an environmental chemist, I I will start with my PhD. So I did my PhD on uh, remediation strategies for industrial polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons (PAH) and in Norway because Norway is uh, a country that is driven by industry, mm-hmm. uh, and this particular industry that I was attached to or company is an aluminium smelting company. And they release a lot of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons into the not into the environment, but they release them as a result of their activities. And before these are discharged into the environment, they have to be cleaned up, be it the air that is coming out or the effluent, solid and liquid effluent. And so the, that was the background to the projects that I, I had to work on. From that, I have been passionate generally about other environmental issues. Now, back home, research on polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons is expensive. <laughs> it's costly to determine pH, the organic reagents, the standards, and so on and so forth. So I have done very little in terms of continuing that uh, on that trajectory. But I've co- focused on uh, heavy metals, which is also a very important aspect of environmental health. And I did not go for the obvious, which everybody goes for, which is heavy metal release associated with mining, associated with heavy duty industry. But I chose to go for heavy metals in what I call unusual places. So just the exposure to heavy metals by the virtue of living. <laughs> so from the cosmetics we apply on, I've done heavy metals on lipstick, for example. Because heavy Lipsticks are colored in nature and they come from heavy metal complexes and there's a threshold that is acceptable so if you look for them and they are high, you could influence public perception. I have done heavy metals and spices used for cooking, heavy metals and white clay which is um, locally called shoeing with which a lot of pregnant women crave to help with nausea. I've looked at heavy metals and fufu which is a popular delicacy in yeah. That's one of the recent, the most recent uh, works we've done on heavy metals and unusual places. Mm. That's very interesting. So, yeah, in terms of um, the research you've done, how has that gained traction with um, um, 
policy makers and the government, for instance. I said, but these things are very interesting. They affect the lives of people. So has there been that interaction with, with policy makers? Not exactly, because uh, generally in Ghana, there's a bit of disconnect between scientists or practitioners of science and then policy makers. Occasionally, there are meetings, but there's no structural arrangement, <laughs> if I should put it that way, that connects science to policy. And so I cannot pinpoint a particular research finding of mine that has directly influenced it. Maybe yes, maybe no, but uh, none that there was a conscious effort to work together at that level. But I know it's the kind of research I do, especially with heavy metals in my other places, is something that the average person can relate to. Everybody uses spices, the average human who wears lipstick and so on and so forth. And so it gets a lot of public interest. Mm. And we've had um, major uh, mainstream media contacting us to do more light on some of our findings. And these are found conversations in spaces that you typically do not expect science to be discussed. So the interesting question would then be, should we still continue eating our fufu or we should uh, and continue using lipsticks and stuff, or we should eat? <laughs> yeah, so with the, these, the, as I said, science is curiosity driven, okay. not necessarily because there's a problem, mm -hmm. they say, but you want to know what's there. Okay. So it, it's not all the findings that are scary. Some are scary. For the lipstick, some are declared and cadmium, uh, and mostly these were the low and Brands. The higher brands are, are, are safe. I'll, I'll simply say that without being specific with the brands. Mm -hmm. And then with fufu, we just have to uh, be careful where we are eating from or where you are blending or getting your fufu meal. Because some meals, just by mere inspection, <laughs> without any knowledge in science, you know that it's either rusty or it's too old and it's likely to bleach into the, the food. Mm. But ideally, if you can mail your own fufu, then you know the source. Yeah. I think you're safe. We've been using blenders for forever and we're okay. You can go on. All right, okay, so, um, so let me, you've mentioned some of the um, challenges in interacting with policy makers, for instance. What are the other challenges you face as an African scientist and as a as a lady um, a female doing science in africa yeah as um, an african scientist i think the challenge the number one challenge is funded because most of our governments are not committed to supporting research and development they talk about it but <laughs> when budgets are red you never hear of a huge allocation to science. It's always lumped with something else and it gets lost along the way. So if our governments will commit to science and technology to go a long way to help with research. And I want to sound this word of caution that it's not every science that translates into mortar or bricks. <laughs> science can just be pure curiosity driven. And some of these approaches have led to groundbreaking inventions. So we should not always look for an immediate return to investment in science. It can be long-term, but the returns can be enormous. We currently, most of our research is funded by external donors, and if you are not the one paying for the research, you don't determine the kind of research that is done. So it might be that some of the research might not look too relevant to the people that we want to influence. But then, hey, you did not pay for it, so you cannot But what about for being a female doing science? As a female scientist, uh, I've heard stories of discrimination, stories of disrespect, but personally, I have not really encountered any such that I, I mean, I, I remember. <laughs> and I say this because of maybe my general outlook on life. I, I just um, appear and present myself as a human being first. And so that's how I approach every situation. And so maybe if someone treats me badly, he treats me badly because they are bad human beings, not because I'm a woman. <laughs> and they could treat a man badly as well. So personally, I don't have any horror stories, but I know that a lot of women have suffered discrimination 
harassment and so on and so forth. But um, I've been fortunate not to have suffered those uh, negative issues. A few, let's also talk about these days where a lot of the opportunities that come in science actually encourage female applicants. It's always a delight when you see the call and under the last line they say female applicants are encouraged. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not that bad. <laughs> I think it's okay. Great. So what would be advice to uh, like a young girl who wants to be a scientist or who wants to be like you in the future? I always say that I don't want you to be like me. Uh, remember a couple of weeks ago I said same to a younger colleague and he was surprised. Yes, I don't want you to be like me. Not because my life is not fantastic. I'm having a blast. But we are different. You cannot be me. <laughs> you can just be the best version of yourself. So my first encouragement is that know yourself. Who are you? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are your fears? And then after knowing yourself, what do you want to do? What do you want to become? Once you're a human being and you have a brain that works, there's nothing you cannot do. So look for champions, people who will urge you or people who will encourage you to do what you want to do to achieve your dream and go for it. So um, you seem to be having a blast, like you said. What is the philosophy that drives your science and research so you, you are having so much fun in this field? Yeah, my, my core principles in life is to make life better. <laughs> if I should sound religious, we are blessed so we become a blessing mm. to others. So that is the philosophy. And then service, the call to service. So even as you say what is, you become a blessing to them. And therefore, that is what has influenced the, the, even the heavy metals in unusual places idea of research that I'm currently on, so that society will better understand the world mm -hmm. as we have it, and hopefully live better lives. Because one of my mentors always says that um, um, people suffer where there is ignorance and where there is sin. And sin not in the biblical sense, but knowing the right and, and doing the wrong. Mm -hmm. So where there is ignorance and there is sin, there is suffering. Mm -hmm. But where people are knowledgeable and they choose to do right, there is joy. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't find any contradiction between being a scientist and uh, being a religious person? Not at all. Okay. Because science is driven by curiosity and intuition. And the part of the human person, the, the three-dimensional human person, the part of the human person responsible for thinking and intuition, and logic and reasoning is a soul. <laughs> so there's definitely something bigger than what we see. And if we read the classics of uh, very influential scientists, some of them refer to faith in, in their writings. And so we cannot say that you know it all. There's always an element of, I don't know, or I cannot explain this. And I think that is where something supreme comes in, and I call it God. Great. So um, then what we can do now is to for you to tell us about your research in, in a local language or in Pigeon. Um, you have to choose which. All right, so I am an account, so mm -hmm. I'll, I'll speak to you. Well, from me, Marian, Asantua, and Kansan, the Kogi, Mitimeka, Kogi. Be a Duma or Kwame Kuma, Siakomo, Mitra, dear, Ewa. And I'm a son, yeah, and Yama who also come. Siakomo, the children, yeah, so we didn't school for the match of my dear one. Yeah, yeah, she shame, I'm trying to say research. And I hear extension works, and also you know, take it here, the boy or minor, and any part of the womb. Now, they were a BIB, a friend of the Department of Chemistry. Department of Chemistry, for no, yeah, chemistry, send the OTD. Now, so many, maybe far from me, a human part, a friend of environmental chemistry. Environment, they make sure they said, never try a question. And environmental chemistry, no, any my try question. And they may hear me to see you here near a fat in the room. A new bra, you know, so a bra, you know, come. 